Before we move on to um, continuing with this addition rule for probability, I thought it might be useful to give you sort of a colloquial distinction between E union F and E intersect F. So I thought I might go back to example nine for a second and just point out the differences between these two things. Because I think these are the two that people are most likely to get tripped up with. So remember that in the context of this example, E was the event that you roll an even number, and F was the event that you roll a multiple of three. So E union F is what you get whenever you combine those two events. But let's think about what this event is in terms of just colloquially joining E with F. So the way that I would phrase this in terms of the original event descriptions E and F is like this. I would say that either E or F happens. And it's okay if both happen. So either E or F or both happens. So in other words, this would be the collection of outcomes that I would be okay with if I needed to roll an even number or a multiple of three or both. So here I've rolled an even number or a multiple of three or both. So notice that both would be rolling a six here because that is both an even number and a multiple of three. So I, I would be happy with a six on both counts. But the point is that if I have a union symbol, I can think of that as E or F. But remember that it, it's not an exclusive or, it's E or F or both of them happening. And similarly, E intersect F has an interpretation so notice that here, this is the set of outcomes that they have in common. The way that I would read this is as E and F. And what I mean by that is that E and F need to occur simultaneously. That is within a single event or a single outcome. So if I want um, to roll an, sorry, this is a hard thing to spell simultaneously while talking, there we go. Um, so if I want to roll an even number and simultaneously roll a multiple of three, there's only one option here. I have to roll a six. Because of the even numbers, I could roll a two, a four, or a six. But if I need to do that and roll a multiple of three, the only one of those that's also a multiple of three would be the six. So I'm going to read E union F as E or F because it describes the set of outcomes that are in E or F or both. And I'm going to re read the intersection as E and F. In other words, both of those events intersect or occur simultaneously. So let's go on to problem 11 here. And for this, I'm going to start using our colloquial reading of E union F or E intersect F. So I'm going to read this as E or F and I'm going to read this side as E and F. In other words, their intersection. So next, let's look at the probability of drawing either a queen or a heart. So I'm going to let E equal the event that you draw a queen. And I will let F equal the event that you draw a heart. And I'll use the probability formula that we have up at the top. So we know that the probability of drawing either a queen or a heart, so notice that this or is a key word here. It's saying that we're happy with either drawing a queen or drawing a heart, which means that we're looking for the probability of E or F. So anytime you're trying to compute a probability that involves an or or an and, it might be a good idea to first just write down um, a description of each of those events separately, because usually those two probabilities are easier to compute. So in this case, the probability that you draw a queen or the probability that you draw a heart, those are a little easier to compute. But if I recopy the probability formula that we have up at the top here, we should have the probability of E plus the probability of F minus the probability of E and F. Now the probability of E is the probability that we draw a queen. There are four queens, out of 52 cards in total. And then we would add together the probability that we draw a heart. There are 13 hearts out of 52 cards. But notice that in this case, 
let's think about the number of cards that we're happy with. So out of the 52 cards, how many cards could I pick out of that deck that I would be happy with? Well, I could grab the four queens, or I could grab any of the 13 hearts, but notice that one of those 13 hearts was a queen. We have a queen of hearts. So the queen of hearts was double counted here. So if I take the four queens and then add the 12 new hearts, what I would get is a 16 card total in our event. So in other words, that's why we need to be subtracting the probability of the intersectional event, which in this case is, notice that E and F would be the event that you draw a queen of hearts, because that would be the event that you draw both a queen and a heart. And the only way for those to happen simultaneously would be for you to draw the queen of hearts. So that's just a single card out of the 52. But notice that's what's going on in the numerator Notice that what's going on in the numerator is just this computation that I did over here on the right. So here we're taking the four queens that we're happy with, plus the 13 hearts that we're happy with. But at this stage, up here at the top, we've double counted the queen of hearts. Because the queen of hearts was up here, it was also down here, but that's only a single card. So we need to subtract one in order to avoid the double counting problem. So we only want to include the queen of hearts once. So far, we've included it twice, so we subtract it once, so that altogether we have just 16 cards in total. And you can check this with a deck of cards if you are still worried about it. You can look for all of the queens or hearts, and you would have a stack of, of sorry, 16 cards in total that you're happy with. That's also the numerator that we'll get here, which makes sense. Because if you wanted to compute the probability of E or F directly, you could also just recognize E or F as this collection of the 16 cards that we're happy with, and then the probability would be the 16 cards that you're happy with divided by the 52, sorry, 52 in total. So you can use this fancy formula for computing that probability, or you can think separately about how many cards you would actually be happy with, but be careful here because you have to avoid double counting. So either of these techniques will work, but notice that this formula that we used here is actually doing the double counting aversion for you. So it will automatically correct any sort of double counting issue that you might have. Whereas if you were just to try computing the probability of the union event right away, you would have to make sure that you avoided double counting on your own. Similarly, if we look at problem 12, here, two dice are rolled, and we want the probability that at least one of them rolls a four. So for this, what I like to do is if I have the sample space written as a table like this, so remember this is our sample space for rolling two dice, we want the probability that at least one of them rolls a four. Let's look at all of the events that we're happy with. And... Let's do this in, in both ways. So we'll compute this probability in two separate ways. One way would be to look for all of the outcomes that we're happy with. And that would be everything in the fourth row and everything in the fourth column. And then you can count the total number of outcomes that I've just circled. So there are six events here, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then there are five new events here, one, two, three, four, five, because we've already counted four, four. So that would be 11 events, in, or sorry, 11 outcomes in total. So the probability of E or F would be 11 out of 36, where E is the event that the first die is a 4, and F is the event that the second die. Oops. Is a 4. So here I'm happy with either the first die a 4, or the second die or a four, uh, showing a 4, or both. So that means I'm computing the probability of the OR event that either the first or the second is showing a 4. 
And we just saw that if you count all of the outcomes that you're happy with, it's 11 out of 36. But notice that to get that 11, we had to avoid double counting the 4, 4 here. So let's find another way where we don't actually have to worry about the double counting issue. For this, I can just use the probability formula. It's the probability that the first die is showing a 4 plus the probability that the second die is showing a 4 minus the probability of their intersection. Now, for this, the probability that the first die is showing a 4, you could look at this sample space that we have above and see that 6 out of the 36 outcomes here involve the first die showing a 4. But you could also recognize that that will reduce to 1 sixth because the first die is independent of the second die. So we also just know that if I wanted the probability of rolling a die and showing a 4, it would be 1 sixth. And same thing for this one. The probability that that second die ends up showing a 4 is also going to be 1 sixth. But I'm just going to write these in terms of their 36 denominator so that I can um, combine these fractions a little more easily. So this is another situation where I would recommend that you avoid reducing these fractions just because we like the fact that they have the same denominator. And then we need to subtract the probability that E and F happens. But if I want the first die to show a 4 and the second die to show a 4, that intersectional event would be 4, 4. So in other words, there's just one outcome in which both of them show a 4. It would have to be rolling a 4, 4 or a pair of 4s. So that would be 1 out of 36. And notice that this gives us the same answer that we got above. So this will end up being 11 out of 36 in total. And then lastly, in this section, we'll look at one more rule for probabilities. Here we have two dice being rolled, and we want the probability that the sum of the numbers is greater than 3. So for this, I'm going to look at the sample space that we have just above here. What this complement rule says is that if you want the probability, so maybe let me do this in a different color. If you want the probability of E complement, then that would be 1 minus the probability of E. And this, if you want sort of an intuitive example, what it's saying is that let's say that there's a 70% chance that it rains tomorrow. That means there's a 30% chance that it does not rain tomorrow. In other words, complementary events have to have probabilities that add up to 1. So I can use this complement rule to compute probabilities a little more easily. If it's easier to compute the probability of E than it is to compute the probability of E complement, then I can get from one to the other by using this formula. So let's let E, well, I'll, I'll let E prime equal the event that the sum of numbers is greater than or equal to, actually it's strictly greater than, strictly greater than 3. Let's think about what the complementary event would be here. Then the complementary event to E prime, which would just be E, is the fact that the sum of numbers is less than or equal to 3. So those two events are complementary. In other words, if you look at the set of outcomes where the probability, or sorry, where the set of numbers sums up to bigger than three, then the set of outcomes that you're missing from that set would be the set of outcomes where the sum is less than or equal to three. So these are complementary events, and that means that their probabilities have to add up to one. But we can use that to our advantage here. That means that if I want the probability of E prime, which is what I wanted at the beginning, then this will be 1 minus the probability of E, and that's 1 minus... Now, E is actually going to be a little bit easier to compute in terms of its probability, because if I want the sum of numbers to be bigger than or equal to 3, that would be this set here, and I would have to spend some time maybe counting that set. So I could do that, but it's easier to count the complementary set, which is up here. So this would be the event E from down here. And that means that E has a probability of 3 out of 36, because there are only three ways to get a sum of less than or equal to 3. So this would be 36 out of 36 minus 3 out of 36, 
which is 33 out of 36. And that's also what we would get as our answer if we had just counted all of the numbers. Uh, sorry, I should say all of the outcomes that lived down here. There are 33 of those. But rather than counting that, it's easier to count the complement and see that the complementary event has a 3 out of 36 probability of occurring, and therefore the event that we're interested in has a probability of 33 out of 36 of occurring. So that's the end of our intro to probability set of notes. Next we're going to talk about random variables and expected value for random variables.